Cool, thanks. Um, hello, I'm Kieran um, from Biomed Central. I thought I'd come to uh, talk to you. Uh, I'll probably actually give more of a Biomed Central perspective because I think we've covered quite a lot of the um, kind of general stuff. So I'm going to talk uh, about one specific um, alternative peer review model that we have operating on one of our journals, which has been going for a few years. And then Simon and Victoria asked me to come and talk a little bit about altmetrics and possible implications that altmetrics might have on peer review. So I'll try and get through fairly quickly. Um, so peer review at Biomed Central, we're an open access publisher of 250 journals across biology and medicine. Um, they have different editorial and peer review models um, across that portfolio. But uh, I think I kind of Irene said just because it's open access, then there's no compromise on rigorous review. It's the business model, and that is distinct. Um, rigor is key. So all journals are expected to hold editorial policies and rigorous peer review. Um, all journals are members of COPE, the Committee on, of Publication Ethics. Um, and we have uh, a lot of journals are edited from by academics around the world. Um, but the publisher kind of actively looks to ensure that robust review is being carried out as much as we can. So there are sort of some um, checks in place. Um, Irina, I think, covered quite a lot of that. Uh, in general, this is the expectations of our editors that our articles are peer reviewed by two to three independent scientific experts, um, statistical referees where needed. Um, in general, uh, acceptance rates are 45 to 55 percent, but we have some highly selective journals and hum, uh, some that are, are less selective and just looking for scientific uh, robustness as opposed to interest level. Um, so I think in general, progress towards open access has gone hand in hand with development of some um, innovative peer review models. And some journals that have adapted um, online only open access models have also sought to tune peer review or make it more transparent. Um, general points that have already been covered, uh, Biomed Central and the BMC series operates a journal cascade system. Um, we have a portability of peer review, which kind of Christopher touched on, um, whereby if a manuscript is reviewed, but we're transferring it to another BMC series journal or another Biomed Central journal, those reports can go with it to reduce the, the burden on peer reviewers. Um, the flagship biology journal of the BMC series also operates a re-review opt-out, and Irene uh, mentioned um, a few sort of issues with iterative peer review and reviewers asking for lots of uh, additional experiments. Um, BMC Biology gives the authors the option of opting out of those experiments as long as they've kind of initially accepted that manuscript. Um, so that is to sort of av avoid that situation where uh, authors are having to iteratively go back and do lengthy experiments for, for minor quibbles from reviewers. Um, the BMC series titles uh, that publish in the, 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 the medical um, areas are open peer review. I think that's already been mentioned. Um, we think that's important, gives full transparency, which is crucial in medical research, uh, is a way of crediting referees. Um, referees and editors are therefore more accountable for the decisions because that process is visible um, in the pre-publication history. Um, the experience of Biomed Central in general is that biologists are more skeptical about open peer review. Um, BMC Cancer, one of the medical titles, does publish quite a lot of basic science with open peer review. Um, and Christopher mentioned that this is kind of a field-specific thing. So in talking to, to academics, open peer review sometimes falls on um, pretty deaf ears. Um, I want to talk specifically about Biology Direct, which is a peer review experiment that we launched in 2006. Um, so as an attempt to address some of the issues that Irene mentioned right at the start of her talk, where people you know, have a slight disgruntlement with, with peer review, as it is at the moment. So the issues um, that the editors were looking to address specifically were uh, the anonymous review. Uh, the, the anonymous reviewer has complete power over the author. Um, reviews can be biased. Uh, additional experiments addressing minor points can be time consuming. Um, and often delayed re reports when they do come back from a reviewer are, are quite cursory, which can be particularly frustrating. So just to run through this um, as quick as I can, the peer review scheme is author driven. Um, so, the, the, the basic steps, initially an author will suggest appropriate members of the editorial board to review their manuscript. Those editorial board members then are then invited um, to do so, so that would be around 15 initially. Uh, if the manuscript attracts the attention of three editorial board members who agree to review it, essentially it's recommended for publication at that point. Um, they put together their comments, the authors then receive those comments, 
they would revise their paper as they saw fit, include the reviewer comments along with um, the author responses, and that's the paper that proceeds uh, to publication. Um, so that full publication has, has the full exchange between the authors and the reviewers. It also has the uh, reviewer names, and they're all included as part of the manuscript, so it's indexed in PubMed, PubMed Central as well. Um, so it's quite interesting that this model essentially removes the role of a professional editor. Uh, the editors in chief very rarely see manuscripts that are passing through peer review. The decision on, as to on whether to publish comes from the author. Um, they may want to go to ahead to publication, even if the re reviews are very negative, um, but those reviews will be part of the manuscript. So it's kind of their discretion. Um, there are a few additional barriers that we have in place um, to stop unsound science being published. So if editorial board members don't think that it's sound science or worthy of publication, then they just decline to review. And, and that's the way that manuscripts that aren't that particularly interesting or sound don't get published. Um, there's uh, checks on the number of manuscripts that author-editor combinations can publish in a single year. So that's limited quite strictly. Um, this is a journal that I work on, and so anecdotal feedback. Um, in quantitative biology, this is a, a kind of well-known forum for constructive debate. Um, and often, when I'm talking to people about it, they'll say that they turn straight to the review section because that's the most interesting part, and they can get a gauge of uh, how interesting the actual science is just by reading that exchange between authors and reviewers. Um, I think I saw a tweet from this conference yesterday, I wasn't here, that uh, in, in Peer J, something like 15% of the traffic goes straight to the open reviews. Um, I'd be really interested to see what that was like for Biology Direct, but we don't have any stats, unfortunately. Um, and just an additional point, this has been publishing for seven and a half years. I don't think there's been one retraction, so it hasn't attracted too much controversial stuff, hopefully. Um, this is a quote from the launch editorial from the Editors-in-Chief. Um, I should probably mention David Lippmann because he's uh, the head of the NCBI, um, which is where PubMed comes from. So it's sort of interesting that it's his perspective um, has led to this journal being launched. Um, so our goal is unapologetically ambitious uh, to establish a new, perhaps better system of peer review and in the process to bolster productive scientific debate. Um, and this last point, and to provide scientists with useful guides to the literature, I think brings me on quite nicely to, to altmetrics because for me this echoes um, quite a lot of what was being stated in the, in the uh, altmetric manifesto which came out a couple of years ago. Um, so on altmetrics, um, clearly dissemination via the internet uh, has changed the landscape of publishing and in, in most disciplines now, electronic journals are the preferred method for accessing journal literature. Um, and also to a large extent, the lives of scholars have moved online. So this provides the opportunity and makes it possible to track the consumption of scholarly articles and other research outputs. Uh, so this was probably what led to the call for alternative or altmetrics um, to make use of those opportunities. Um, Altmetrics itself look to bring together a number of different ways that research outputs can be shared and discussed and referenced. Um, so the number of times a research paper uh, gets cited, viewed, downloaded, shared, bookmarked, tweeted about, liked um, on a social media platform, mentioned or recommended by a post-publication review service like a faculty of a thousand. Um, they have a benefit over citation metrics in that they are harvested in real time, so potentially a quicker indication of reach or impact than waiting for citations to start to accrue. Um, they're usually built on open data platforms, um, so open web sources such as open access journals, web-based research sharing services, and social media, which allow this data to be um, referenced. Um, and a note on the last point that's quite interesting, so the number of uh, academics using Twitter seems to be relatively high and increasing um, quite a lot at the same time. There's some interesting research on that. Um, so I guess the long-term aim of article level and altmetrics is to look at the scientific community's reaction to an article um, following publication. Uh, so what people are looking at, how much is being discussed, what's being said about it. Uh, finding ways then to capture and represent that information to help people navigate the research uh, and find out what's important to them that's been published recently. Um, I probably don't need to reiterate any arguments about impact factor being a bit of an outdated proxy for uh, assessing individual article impact. Um, and obviously the journal's been traditionally a kind of filter for quality and interest, but altmetrics uh, is potentially a replacement for things like the impact factor, um, allowing people to filter through a large amount of research uh, and bringing the most interesting and important work to an individual to light. 
Um, altmetrics also potentially allowing uh, individual scientists to assess their own output, um, can direct them to people that are talking about their research and therefore might be potential collaborators. Um, also might be useful for, for, for funding bodies uh, for use in research assessment activity. Um, also some researchers are starting to use article level metrics and alt metrics on their CVs or their research assessments. Um, I think another exciting prospect for altmetrics is uh, they can potentially help give an understanding of the channels of re of that, that research findings are disseminated. Um, there's a few kind of nice case studies on that. Unfortunately, I haven't included them. Um, just a quick note about what Biomed Central is doing. We've embedded um, altmetric information from altmetric.com. Um, so altmetric.com tracks online mentions of articles across social media. Um, this is the screenshot of what you see uh, when you're on their site. So that's the altmetric score in the center of that donut is uh, based on the volume and source of the mentions of an article across um, media and social media. And it, I guess it's just the fact that it's a score is a bit contentious. Um, the score, I think the way that it's calculated is it's, it weights tweets and it weights mentions um, from scholars or sources that cover mostly science. Uh, it keeps them a, a preferential weight than other sources. And to me, that has a little bit of a similarity with Google PageRank, perhaps. But I think that that kind of way of calculating a score does remain a bit contentious at the moment, but it's quite interesting. Um, also on that page, you get a breakdown of uh, the score by source or activity, snippets of the conversation, um, and an idea of, of context, so how this article ranks against sim similar articles. Um, so I guess this is both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, the qualitative things you can kind of link through to and see it might be of interest if you're a researcher. So there's a few, there's a proliferation of, of um, altmetric providers like this, other ones of note, uh, Impact Story and Plum Analytics. Um, you can basically get altmetrics on anything with a DOI. So you can plug your DOI of any kind of research output, be that a data set or a slideshow, <laughs> um, and uh, get the altmetrics on it to see what kind of social impact it's having. Um, I think that's probably one of the most important things about altmetrics is that those additional research outputs. Uh, and I guess you raised that question at the end of your slides, what, what constitutes a research output? Um, sorry. Um, and those that won't go through traditional peer review, like you know, whether it's audio or video or, or, or data sets, might benefit from some kind of um, review treatment from peers in this way. Um, also quite interesting for repository administrators who are starting to embed our metrics at the article or, or unit level uh, within repositories to complement traditional metrics um, for use download citations, etc. Um, we work with Medicine Sans Frontieres who have an open repository with Biomed Central and they're really keen to see whether alt metrics can help them assess um, the impact of what they're putting into their open repositories and I'm guessing that that's <laughs> relatively common. Um, so to alt metrics and peer review then, I guess there are, are, are more questions at the moment than there are, there are answers. Are these complementary uh, approaches or will Altmetrics replace traditional peer review eventually. There's been some quite interesting uh, debate in Nature recently. Um, Jason Bream, the guy who coined the term Altmetrics, published something, and I think it's quite sort of points towards a world where the traditional peer review and the professional editor doesn't really exist, and it's replaced by this suite of Altmetrics and algorithms to do it um, for you. So it's, it's an interesting time, I think. Um, I guess the Altmetric approach can be thought of as tracking the, com the, the community response to a paper post publication. Um, so bringing together thoughts and comments of the community uh, where they're talking about a peer review, a, a paper, I should say, once it's been published. Um, there's obvious benefits to this. The, the kind of classic example cited is uh, the Arsenic Life paper, which was published in Nature in 2010, and a very public treatment of that paper afterwards on Twitter and in blogs, which led to a kind of community um, rebuttal uh, very, very quickly, um, maybe quicker than it would have been if it was citations um, and publications further down the line. Um, there's a continued introduction and growth of journals which publish on the basis of scientific soundness. We talked about those already. So PLOS One, BMC Research Notes, PJ, F1000 Research. Um, so potentially there's a, a role for altmetrics in navigating this literature um, for the individual researcher to find out what's of interest to them. 
uh, and I guess the, the attractive thing is that if an individual can specify the criteria um, that they find interesting, they would then be able to navigate that literature on the basis of those criteria. I think overlay journals, um, Irene mentioned these as well. So secondary sources that sit above the primary literature and potentially direct people to a selection of the best or most relevant content uh, online. Um, perhaps altmetrics could inform those choices. Um, I heard an interesting thing from the Frontier series of journals. They commissioned short, um, short reviews fairly quickly after uh, interesting research articles are published. And the way that they go through that commissioning process is to look at um, article accesses and altmetrics for what's been published in their journals. And they obviously then have a, a secondary um, sort of selection process where somebody looks and says, right, that's just about a drug or sex. That's not really appropriate. But th they're looking for things that are um, of interest in being discussed in the community and then going and commissioning additional reviews on them. Um, the Journal of Digital Humanities is doing that. And there's another interesting atmospheric chemistry journal which has kind of two tiers of publication. So the first, which is very much, um, it has public comment uh, on papers that are uploaded. And then a second tier journal which sort of cherry picks the most interesting or maybe the, 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 uh, um, yeah, the most interesting publications. Uh, so yeah, I guess in summary, I'd say that it's quite an interesting field which is developing quickly. The publisher perspective is that, um, as Christopher said, the community will probably decide what's, what's useful and interesting. So yeah, thanks. <laughs>